All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm sure folks are still trickling in, um, but we're going to go get started on time. Uh, so excited to be here um, to welcome you to the first program in the series, Women in Power, 100 Years After the 19th Amendment, presented by Miss Foundation for Women and the Brooklyn Historical Society. I'm Raquel Willis. I am a writer and activist and the director of communications for Ms. Foundation, and I'm so excited to be tonight's moderator. So today is a big day. 100 years ago, on August 18, 1920, there was the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which granted many women the right to vote for the first time in our country's, country's history. As we celebrate this milestone, Brooklyn Historical Society and Miss Foundation have come together to uncover the nuances and unfinished work of this accomplishment. Though the fight for women's suffrage is considered the origins of the feminist movement, it left black women and many other women of color and other women on the margins without the rights and protections to make their voices fully count. This series will unpack five facets of the gender and racial equity gap that remain in play today. Economic power, caretaking power, electoral power, people power, and tonight's program, body power. Before I introduce our powerful speakers, which I'm sure you're so ready to hear from, I have just a few more things to share. We got to clean up in house a little bit. First, you are all invited to send your questions throughout the program. Type them into our Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And for those interested in buying copies of Tressie McMillan Cottom and Jennifer Finney Boylan's latest books, Tressie's is Thick and Jennifer's is Good Boy, we have partnered with the Community Bookstore on 7th Avenue in Brooklyn, and you can find a link to purchase these books through that local shop in the chat. So we're keeping it local tonight. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my conversation partners, Tressie McMillan Cottom, PhD is an associate professor in the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and senior research fellow at UNC Center for Information, Technology, and Public Life. Her research spans higher education, work, race, class, gender, and digital societies. She is the author of multiple books, including Lower Ed and the aforementioned Thick, which was a nonfiction finalist for the National Book Awards, which is major. I shouldn't have to tell you that. <laughs> and she's also the host, one of the hosts of the Culture Podcast with Roxanne Gay, Here to Slay. Welcome, Tracy. Hello, my friend. How are you this evening? I'm so excited to be in space with you again. Well, thank you. Same here. I hope you feel as good as you look. <laughs> well, thank you. You <laughs> too. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure right. to be in this company tonight. Yeah. Thank you. And our next panelist is Professor Jennifer Finney Boylan. So we are going to school tonight, y'all. The author of 16 books and counting, I'm sure. The inaugural Anna Quinlan writer in residence at Bernard College of Columbia University. And a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times. Her 2003 memoir, She's Not There, A Life in Two Genders, was the first best-selling work by a transgender American. She is a novelist, a memoirist, and short story writer nationally known as an advocate for human rights. And of course, her latest release, Good Boy, is out now. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But welcome, Jennifer, how are you? I'm fantastic. How great that we're here. 
and I'm honored to be with both of you. Yes, this is going to be a powerful and amazing conversation. And I, I, I don't know if folks know, but just hearing your resumes, both individually, I mean, we're going to have a very deep conversation. But if folks don't follow you on social media or know some of your other work, they also are just so glued into culture and make all of this work so accessible. So thank you both. Well, it's great to be here. And you know, it's, it's an amazing day. Here we are 100 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And it's such a powerful day. It's a day to be proud of, but it's also a day to take stock of all the work that's been left undone. Absolutely. So that takes us into our first question. The centennial of the 19th Amendment's ratification today calls us to reflect on the history of women-led movements in this country. Particularly Black women and trans women have historically experienced marginalization within the feminist movement and its various iterations. How do both of you reconcile that history and own your identity as feminists all at once? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I, you know, I've never had that struggle that is often discussed about the, the struggle between race and gender, and I would add class uh, to that. Um, if anything, I thought, you know, feminism, capital F, white feminism, uh, needed to reconcile with the idea of me, <laughs> the idea of my life and my place in a feminist narrative just really never felt like it was a compromise to me. Um, but then again, I grounded my feminism in a slightly different origin story. So on the 100th day anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I wait for the Voting Rights Act, right? I, I ground my sort of uh, intersectional feminism, if we want to use everyone's favorite words these days, if you want to do womanism, uh, I think I also associate with that. Um, but I just have a different historical origin story, which is not to say that it is not intertwined um, with the, uh, the suffrage movement, but I understand a history that is grounded in indigenous women's understanding of uh, power uh, that, uh, you know, far preceded the idea that white women had about uh, property ownership uh, and voting privileges. Mine is grounded in uh, the West African traditions that traveled with us across the diaspora that very much understood matriarchal power systems. So these things were not antithetical to the historical origins of my personal uh, experience of feminism. It was actually in coming to age and becoming educated, as you pointed out a little earlier. I've done a lot of school, uh, as has Jenny. And, uh, you know, as you start to move up that ladder, if anything, it was the class mobility mm. that really made me feel the conflict of what I think some people talk about when they talk about marginality within dominant white feminist movements. The class mobility uh, really, really brought home for me how much white feminism hadn't reckoned with the idea of me. <laughs> um, and so on the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, it's an interesting moment to take stock of how well white feminism has done. I actually think black feminism is doing really well for itself. I think we have a, a lot to our credit. <laughs> I think we're doing, I mean, we're having a, you know, we still have a lot to work out, don't get me wrong. Um, but this sort of, you know, multi-ethnic diasporic understanding of uh, gender and race and self, I feel like we're, we're doing really well with that. If anything, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to, to think about how dominant feminist movements are doing with marginality. And I think it has done better with language I do think I wanna be really fair here about what I think has happened. I think especially over the last 15 or 20 years, I think we've seen a sort of concerted effort to at least adopt the language of, um, of uh, inclusivity, uh, if we wanna say that. I don't know that if we've gone so far as to grapple with the actual people that come with that language. I think that remains a challenge and that is because people come with challenges to power. Right. Um, and it's difficult. You can't really disentangle the appeal for uh, voting rights from the appeal for property ownership 
and how much that is grounded in race and whiteness and class. Um, and so disentangling those things as people want to become included through our language being included in the discourse of white feminism, that is always more complicated. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. But it's a wonderful moment to think about how far white feminism has come. <laughs> Well, I think that, that's a kick over to you, Jenny. What are your thoughts on reconciling yeah. history? What's the, isn't there a Bob Dylan song about, I've got a head full of ideas and they're driving me insane. <laughs> Jesse, you really um, make me think about so many things um, with what you said. And uh, the thing about class, not least. Um, so, I've often, you know, looked at um, looked at this country and thought about whether whether it includes me, um, and I guess that's maybe that's one of the things that we begin with when we talk about the Nineteenth Amendment. Is so um, so a hundred years ago today, um, constitutionally, anyhow, uh, we we agreed women's voices count, or at the very least, women's votes count. Um, you know, it took um, 80 years to get to that point from, I mean, before that point when we said that black votes count or that black people count as citizens, count as more than three fifths of the citizen. I mean, we keep going back, we can go back to the, the founding fathers and think about what, it, what, did they, what did they mean? Who did they think counted in the American story? So, um, you know, it, it, today is a day to celebrate. But as I, as I look at this anniversary, I also think, well, is, so, so where do I stand in relationship to that? And it's, and it's complicated, man, because um, on the one hand, as a transgender woman, I feel way on the outside. I mean, I've always felt way on the outside and I, I feel like, um, the trans movement itself, I mean, it's, it's a gnarly movement, you know, I mean, we're still, we're, we're still grappling with issues, we're still trying to work out the language, we're working out the discourse, we're trying to figure out who's, what does it mean to be trans, what does it mean to be male or female or non-binary. Um, and so I feel like, um, when I look at where I stand in relationship to this country, I, I feel, um, uh, on the outside, I feel way on the outside, and I and I feel sometimes like, like if I if I write a piece for the New York Times in which I, you know, deign to say that transgender people are human beings, um, I I know that I'm in for a couple weeks of online hatred and just kind of this 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 the kind of unbelievable bullshit. <laughs> that people will send my way for saying something as controversial as the fact that, um, that, that I'm human and that people like me are human. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a white woman. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a white lady who teaches at an Ivy League college. So you could make the case that, okay, I'm trans on the one hand, but I'm, here I am in this position of Privilege and power, and so how do I how do I um, how do those two identities speak to each other? And then you know, as my mother was an immigrant, um, I grew up in a bit in a, a a lower class, so-called lower class working class family that um, um, was working class and then became middle class and then became you know very successful, and so I I, I wonder. I mean, in some ways, that's that's the American dream, right? But on the other hand, I think, well, um, wh again, where does um, where does class fit into this conversation about who belongs and who doesn't belong? Um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm asking more questions than I am answering at this at this point. But um, when I think about um, the women's movement and I, and and the trans part of the women's movement in particular. I think about, you know, historian, that wonderful historian, Barbara Fields, who teaches at Columbia, who long ago said famously that um, the Civil War 
you know, supposedly the Civil War is, 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 was, was won by the North, and yet the Civil War is still going on. Mm -hmm. um, as long as some people live in houses and some, some people live on the street, it's still going on. As long as some people are citizens um, uh, and some people are not, as long as some people's voices count, and some people's voices don't count, it's still going on. And as we've seen these last four years, you know, unfortunately, it can still be lost. Absolutely. Thank you both for sharing on that opening question. We're already digging deep. Um, you know, I, in kind of framing this conversation for tonight, um, we thought it was important to delve into um, the body, right? And what does it mean to be a woman in, um, embodied in so many different ways, understanding that there have been so many scripts, so many um, expectations on a particular type of womanhood. Um, and so while it may seem, I guess, reductive maybe to some of our participants, so then for us to kind of make this uh, connection between uh, uh, the power of being able to vote and, and in some ways have your voice heard. Um, but also, what does that mean in terms of the body? And, and for women throughout time, reckoning with the understanding that um, we've been reduced to our bodies, right? And, and what our bodies may or may not be capable of, what they may or may not represent in a larger society. Um, and so I want to ask the question, um, and we'll start with you, Tressie. Um, how have you reclaimed your body for yourself in, in this society and in this world? Mm -hmm. um, and particularly, you've talked a lot about, obviously, body um, and the body positivity conversation, what that means, but of course, also the construct of beauty. Mm -hmm. And so can you kind of walk us through your thoughts on reclaiming the body, beauty, and what that means in terms of a type of power. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can or not. You know, um, I will say I would be so disappointed if I thought the audience, anybody in the audience thought that the idea of linking um, power, which is what the vote is fundamentally about, uh, is about participating um, in the nation states uh, global dominance over other nation states. I mean, it, it is, it, you know, it is an act of power to be able to vote, which is why, uh, you know, people have died to control it and died to get access to it. I would hope nobody would think it would be reductive to think about that impact on the body. Because when you talk about dying to vote, you are quite literally, ex you know, laying your body on the line for that access. And when you talk about why somebody would want to deny categorically a group of people um, the franchise, it, it was almost always grounded in whose bodies were valued and to what extent. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, black people are brought here only as bodies, no spirit, no uh, intellectual energy, uh, no philosophical energies. We're quite literally only bodies. And of those bodies, women who could reproduce were a certain type of value that was so valuable it could not be trusted to vote. Right. Couldn't be trusted with that much value. It wasn't that black women had no value, it was that we were so valuable. Right as the engines of reproducing capital uh, for the United States of America as a global power, that we could not also be entrusted to vote because then you would be controlling something that was considered extremely economically and politically important. It seems to me that the question of the vote is just fundamentally about uh, the power in, that the body has. Um, so I hope nobody thinks it's reductive. Now, my answer might be reductive. <laughs> Right. Let's see. I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting down and I'm thinking um, when I, you know, the essay that is in the book that I think that people, you know, that are refer when you refer to like my discussion about beauty, it started from a couple of places, which was when you read mainstream feminist theory and literature, actually, until you get to some of the more recent trans writers, to be quite honest and fair, um, who I think have done some of the most or certainly are beginning to do some of the most transgressive theorizing in that area, by the way. But until you kind of get to some of that literature, I don't know, I was, I was left wanting by what feminist thought, and this includes black feminist thought for the record, um, had done to reckon with what beauty really does um, and, and, and what it was. Um, I do think that we are 
far more comfortable talking about it as an, uh, you know, as a dichotomy. It is either oppressive or it is liberating. I just tend to how, how we tend to theorize it. Um, and my experience of that is that it was both. Mm -hmm. um, that very much like all of our other identities or our location uh, uh, in social relations, that things are more than one thing at a time. Um, and what I was reckoning with is how something could be both beautiful and uh, devalued. How something of beauty holds so much, so much power when attached to the idea of gender and womanhood um, uh, in this context, but at the same time could, of, of course, be so highly contested. Um, how it could both feel good, liberating, the adornment of ourselves, the presentation of our bodies as a way of demonstrating our autonomy over ourselves, as signaling to the world, uh, you know, um, our rank and esteem, uh, like the body can do and, and is supposed to do all of those things. As it seems to be historically one of the earliest things that human beings do after we learn how to communicate with each other. It is to present ourselves physically to each other in ways um, that help order the society, right? So there seems to be something like a real natural desire to do that. Um, but that natural desire, as always happens in a system of extraction and oppression, had been transformed into this really oppressive regime of a certain way of being beautiful. So I was thinking about that thing out there, beauty as an external object, something outside of my body, and how my body is supposed to always live up to, um, or at least to desire wanting to be beautiful. And really that's what it came down to for me, that it was not about becoming beautiful because structurally black women can never be beautiful not externally. In the political economy, black women can never be beautiful, not categorically. Some of us can be exceptions in the same way a couple of us can be admitted to Harvard every year. You know, they're always exceptions, <laughs> right? But categorically, we cannot be. Um, and I thought about what that did as a system of politics about who was allowed to do what. And much like the vote, it is about who gets to control your relationship uh, to masculinity and whiteness and that power that is so tied to property and their, and their ability to control space and other people and other human beings. Um, and then, you know, and one of the things that I'm still working through is something that I don't think we have a really precise language for, which is how do we acknowledge that that's a thing, that something, you know, sometimes it really is something to out to get you as the saying goes, right? There really is this big capital B beauty that is out to get some of us, right? That needs us as fuel for the machine. How do we separate that from what I think is a very basic human desire to be desired, right? Mm -hmm. How do we come up with something liberatory about it is okay to desire being desired or desirable without reinforcing this external system of oppression that says there is a way to be a woman and there's absolutely only two ways to be a black woman. Right, um, and it is always embodied, and it's always, uh, you know, structured as a site of extraction for somebody else. Right, you can extract forms of black beauty and certainly make that profitable, um, but black women can never own that and take that into that sort of space as a liberate as a liberatory project. Not without reckoning with all that other stuff. Um, so I'm I'm, a, I'm more clear on labeling what's been done to me, which is what the essay was about. And it was about me coming to understand my place in a social hierarchy because so much about being a marginalized person, um, which I think Jenny spoke to earlier, um, is understanding that there's something bigger than you that shapes what you are allowed to be in the world. And until you reconcile with that, I actually, you know, this is, this is just Du Bois and double consciousness and the two-ness of marginality and oppression. I honestly think that until you accept that, you can't actually own any autonomy you do have. I actually think this is one of the first political projects of being a black woman is to own that there is something out there, right? But then within that, it is to construct our own, you know, liberatory projects. But understanding that does not mean that dismantles whiteness. It does not mean it dismantles the oppression of gender. It does not undo class. It doesn't do any of those things. That you can have autonomy and freedom and still be in a fundamentally unequal society. Like that, that tension to me is the, is very much the experience of uh, being black and in this body. And so until I owned that, until I was able to label accurately, 
what was being done to me, um, I didn't feel my body in its like most expansive sense. I mean, um, I talked to a lot of women who have read that uh, um, over the last couple of years who talk about knowing the moment when they sort of disassociate it from their bodies. Mm. Like in how, how almost every woman I talked to had this moment, certainly every black woman of dissociation. I mean, just to think about how brutal that must be to be, you know, that is so normal that it becomes part of the coming of age story. Exactly. Dissociation is the come of age, right? It's so, it seems so brutal to me, but that we could start to label it and identify that moment seemed to me really part of the, the, it's the start of the political work anyway, of owning what we were and what we are, or at least that, that's been my experience of it. So it's not until I could label that beauty was something that was being done to me that I could kind of let that go and come into the fullness of myself. I think that is great, especially this language around, not that it's a great thing that it exists, but <laughs> I think the tool of discussing um, this dissociation, and I actually, it, this is still in general the same question, Jennifer, but I, I think some of what you unpack in your latest release, Good Boy, mm -hmm. is obviously around kind of in some ways discussing um, what it means to be in your body, but have kind of all of these conflicted ideas of what it means to be in your body, right? And even now, as you write about masculinity and, and coming into your womanhood, having had a boyhood, um, could you kind of talk about what that experience was like and kind of having those vantage, various vantage points to look at? It's almost like a prism in some ways of that dissociation. Every transgender woman knows, really identify with what Tressie was talking about. The idea of, um, you, you, you know, standing outside yourself, um, disassociating from yourself, being bodiless this before, before transition. That's very much the way I felt um, back when I was a boy. And I, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that um, for many transgender women talking about the time pre-transition as boyhood is, is problematic and, um, uh, and I, I, I use that language, but I don't, um, I know other people don't use that language and I don't want to, I'm not speaking for anyone other than myself, particularly someone who came out at, at age 40. I, I do acknowledge that I did have this, you know, many decades of my life where at least as far as everyone else was concerned, you know, I, I, I lived in the world as a male-bodied person. Um, but I, I, I try to figure out how do I connect who I am now to who I was then. And I think you have to build a bridge between your present and your past. Um, it, it's easy, and it's not just a, a, you know, a trans thing to think about life in terms of before and after. But, you know, there's... No one's no one's life is a before and after. Life is, life is one thing. It's a long um, journey, and you're you're gonna look in the mirror at some point, whether you're trans or not, and and ask who is that person. Um, and even now that I'm in my sixties, um, you know, as an older woman, um, you know, <laughs> I have the kind of. It's obviously it's not the same as when I was pre-transition and looking in the mirror and, and looking at that boy and thinking, what? But as an older woman now, um, I, I look in the mirror. I mean, you can see my, my, um, my COVID gray <laughs> coming out. Um, and, you know, we, we, we don't talk about transgender women or men for that matter, or non-binary people and aging. We, the, the narrative around trans talk is so much around transition. And, you know, transition for me was over a third of my life ago. You know, it was my late 30s. I'm in my 60s now. And um, so some of the urgent questions of transition, those are long, are long past. But as an older woman, I am, I am still looking in the mirror and asking myself, well, who are you now? Um, and, you know, Beauty, I think particularly in the transgender world, 
it, it, so many of the things which you said, Tracy, really, really ring bells for me because on the one hand, to, to finally look in the mirror and see the, some, some reflection of, the, of, of who you have in your heart, who you, who, you, who you know you are when your eyes are closed, to open your eyes and see that woman, you know, that, that is, that's, it's so unbelievably powerful. Um, and so beauty um, can be this thing that we, that we aspire to. And it makes us feel good because the thing that was, you know, that was stuck inside of us is now visible. Um, I always like to, to show people the, because I'm, I think you know I'm, I'm severely hard of, hear, hard of hearing. So uh, the ASL sign for transgender is this, which is like a flower that's inside your, your heart that's stuck there, but it comes out and the flower opens and it can go back in your heart in the right direction. Um, that's, what you f that's what we struggle with, getting the thing that's inside out. And yet, beauty is also, as Tracy said so articulately and eloquently, tyrannical. Uh, and creates this thing that we can never really achieve and which we compare ourselves to um, unfairly. And I think particularly in trans circles, um, there's, there, especially among trans women, I'll say, there's a real, um, you know, we, 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 we hand the microphone to people who are pretty um, and and I, you know, I really, I really struggle with that because on the one hand, I want to say the hell yes, you know, so and so is is beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know what what a miracle is that? Here's a trans woman. Look at her. Look at how powerful she is and how beautiful she is and how she owns that, and that inspires me. And at the same time, though, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't go on this whole journey to be to be beautiful. And now that I'm in my 60s, and ahead of, ahead of me is my 70s and my 80s, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that's not what's going to define me for the for for the next you know 30 or 40 years, um, and 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 shouldn't define us. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, man. I, I I really feel this struggle because on the one hand, I really um, I, I celebrate our beauty of, 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 of that trans women have and that we have fought. It's harder for than anyone can possibly understand. The threat to our lives to be ourselves. And yet having, you know, done all that, having taken all those risks, here we are in the world as ourselves. And now we, and not unlike cis women, now have to live up to this mm -hmm. insane standard. And so now, one of the things I can tell you, like the difference between pre-transition and now, now I weigh myself. <laughs> now I own a scale, you know, and, you know, I look at those numbers. Well, pre-transition, it, it never occurred to me to even know how much I weighed because who would care, you know? And, you know, now, and you know what? Someone said, would you like a piece of blueberry pie? I'm like, why, yes, that looks good. And now I'm like, oh, I'll just have a little sliver what does that mean? I only have a little sliver. <laughs> you know, like who, who am I trying to be thin for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's so interesting to hear both of you speak about um, beauty in, in this way um, it, with all of these connections. Right. And I think there's just, there's such a universal conversation to, the expectations that I think all of us feel around gender and of course for women um, and then of course around beauty and embodiment of womanhood and gender in the right way and to hear both of you it's like, you know for me it's as a black trans woman it's like hearing the two sides of my brain that are like Mm -hmm. You know, what are the standards? Is the standard, you know, black women's beauty or this kind of general trans beauty and, and all of this stuff. So it's, it's powerful to hear both of you have this conversation on this. And I, I actually wonder if we can jump to 
what are ways that you think women on the margins, regardless of, of their different identities, can um, be in solidarity with each other around some of these standards? Or is that even possible? You know, we hear a lot about um, solidarity being for white women, right? Um, I'm sure, Tressie, you've heard that a lot. Um, maybe even said it, you know, I've probably said it a few times. <laughs> wink, wink. But, um, you know, and, and then I'm sure for you, Jennifer, especially around um, trying to consider what it looks like for cisgender women or, or, or feminists who are not trans um, to show up more for the trans community. I mean, what does that look like? How do we unpack that potential solidarity? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about what Jennifer was saying about, um, you know, and I really do think, that, I think the, the roots of it, or at least the tensions of that is, can be found in our discussion about beauty, right? I mean, I think understanding, so if we start with the fact that I was just thinking about what Jennifer was talking about weighing herself, and I was, um, and I was, I was thinking about, of course, how much beauty is tied to which bodies, right? Which bodies are acceptable and who is responsible for disciplining the body and uh, who's supposed to do all of that work. And then I think about, because again, I think about class quite a bit. I think about who can afford to discipline the body, which then becomes a whole other question about class and resources and access. Um, and then you think of the body as uh, beauty being so tied to health beauty being used as a weapon to access health so that you can actually just stay healthy. Uh, you know, I was living in Atlanta. Um, I had many um, mostly black trans women friends and who chose to live in Atlanta. I remember uh, talking with them about how difficult it was to access health care just about anywhere else in the country. Um, and while it was difficult in Atlanta, it was at least possible with some bootstrapping, you know, to just get basic health care. We're not talking about the health care uh, necessary for transitioning. We mean something for your blood pressure, which is a racialized disease, <laughs> a consequence, I might add, of lack of solidarity and political disenfranchisement, right? Black folk are more likely to have uh, blood pressure because we have to deal with white people. Um, and that's scientifically true, by the way. I've got citations. And, you know, it's so, you know, just talking about just getting like basic access to healthcare and how so many of even our questions about, um, beauty are really just are really about everything else. It is about politics and economics and belonging and health and wellness and who is allowed to have that and what price we pay to try to access it. I think about beauty as, uh, as protection, as safety. Um, I think about beauty as access and all of those things. And so when we talk about solidarity, I think one of the reasons it is so hard is because when we're talking about one thing, we're really talking about something else depending on who you are. So much of solidarity to me is about having a language that is as nuanced as the people who need it, but as accept, but accessible enough for the people who need it. Like that's to me the tension. So the fact I'm just thinking about, it, I can go into a room of people where we are absolutely in solidarity, but you would bring up something like beauty and we would be using the same words, we'd be talking about something vastly different, right? One sister would be saying beauty, but she means being safe. Somebody else would be talking about beauty and she would mean being desirable. Somebody else would be talking about it and they would be mean in healthcare, right? And so I really, I think so much about when we talk about solidarity, um, how much we need a language that allows for people's lives. Um, and sometimes the language we have inherited from people who have more privilege than us doesn't allow that. Right. So see, beauty actually probably isn't even a good word for it then if we start talking about it that way. We probably do. It's one of the reasons why I tried to talk about it as beauty capital. Or I really do think we need to talk about maybe separating beauty from desire or how we talk about what is a healthy body probably needs to be separated from what is an acceptable body. Right. A thin body is not a healthy body. A thin body is a projection of whiteness and class onto other people to exclude those people who do not fit into that mold, for example. Um, and so, you know, having a more precise language uh, seems super important. And I gotta say, I'm actually on this one, I think, you know, I'm not a hopeful person by nature, I'm more pragmatic, but I actually, I know there's a lot of, there are a lot of challenges with it. 
and <laughs> we get we get more flame wars than maybe some of us would like. Jennifer talks about the people emailing her every time she publishes something in the Times, asserting that she's a human being. Right? Um, happens, you know, every third day. Uh, in response to a article or something on social media or something. We've all been in these spaces and we've seen the flame wars, but I actually think the flame wars might be indicative of progress. Because the flame wars are usually happening because you've had some sparks, right? Uh, and I think that's what happens when people try to figure out new language. Um, and we've had a lot of flame wars, so hopefully that means we're making some progress on some better language. Because what I think people are really pushing for is saying, the words you're using to describe me don't fit. Right, and we push back on it. And honestly, in some of the, you know, especially I think young feminists, um, uh, especially queer feminists and queer feminists of color are just doing such a better job of getting a better language for all of this. And that is for me part of probably the challenge if you wanna get all ideological about it. I think it's both a practical issue and it's an ideological issue. Um, and then I think it's about finding always um, the people who are most marginalized, and if you figure out how to set them free, you figure it out for everyone else. I mean, the greatest lesson for me uh, on this day would be the 19th Amendment, right? So white women get the right to vote, but actually not all white women. I mean, we say that sort of blithely, right? Poor white women still had trouble voting. They were still f facing some literacy tests. They were still facing patriarchal violence when they tried to vote. Right. But now what if they had actually fought for black women's right to vote? Well, that would have been disentangling the vote from property in some really key ways that would have also better included poor white women. I think there's a lesson in there for us about looking at the margins. And if you figure out what that is that best serves uh, folks at the margins of the margins, you usually do better for everybody else. I mean, you know, that's the, uh, you know, you know, none of us is free until, you know, all of us are free kind of thing, right? That's, I mean, it's the basic premise. It's harder in practice than it is obviously in theory. Um, uh, but everything is harder than it should be when you try to actually do it. Doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Yeah. Right. Jennifer, what Well, that really, again, Trustee, everything you say really um, fires me up. It, it, it makes me think about I really like what you were saying about um, the, you know, the fighting that we see, um, the flame wars. Um, it, it maybe it is a sign of progress um, because it, what's what's both painful and exciting is that the discourse. Um, I'll speak just around uh, about trans stuff just for, for the moment. That the discourse is being worked out. Um, it's I mean it's happening. Mm -hmm. And we're watching it, and it's awkward. Um, when I came out in in 2000, um, you know, I remember going to like book events and people coming from like a hundred miles away because I was the first transgender person they'd ever seen in the flesh. I was the first person who was public in any way. Um, I remember when I when I broke the news at my college, there were people who had never heard of the word transgender that. It was like something I'd made up myself. Um, <laughs> I kind of invented it in my spare time. Um, and when I when I found myself put into the position of being a public person on and being try, trying to talk about the issues, what I knew was my own story. What I knew was my own life and my own perspective, which was a limited perspective. It was a perspective of, you know, an upper middle class white lady academic. Um, and I, I didn't know about the lives of black trans women, really, 20, 20 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of mortifying to say that, but it's, it's just true. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know, I wasn't, I didn't know any other trans women. Um, you know, living living in my little my tiny little town in Maine, um, maybe I don't know. Maybe there's a reason I people thought I'd come up with the whole thing myself. So as time has gone on and I've met more people and I've heard more stories, I've begun to realize how much I don't know and how much the language has to change and how much the language is changing. 
so that so that now if I go to if I go to a college now, well, this is back in the day when we could leave the house. Mm-hmm. But you know, back when I used to leave the house and speak at colleges, it was very typical for me to be at a podium and um I remember a, a, an event actually I did at um Brandeis. This maybe maybe five years ago. And it was an event that had been sponsored by the women's studies class of 1970. And so kind of in the middle of the, of the auditorium were all the benefactors, women, women in their late 60s and 70s who were like really second wave feminists who had no idea what this whole trans thing was. And everyone was kind of, you know, leaning forward trying to hear. Um, meanwhile, in the front row were like all these non-binary genderqueer people who were listening to Jenny Boylan like I was some, you know, relic from a hundred years ago, <laughs> you know, with my, with my, my funny little stories about how we should all love each other. Um, and, 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 and like the, the younger generation of, of, of advocates and, um, you know, uh, I want to, you know, gender agitators, you know, wanted wanted me to shut up and get with the program and meanwhile then there's all these other people in the audience who who are just kind of showed up and don't know anything about trans stuff anyway so how do we get everybody onto the same platform how do we bring everybody up to the same moment um i guess for me what i'm trying to do right now actually is to do more listening than talk right now i'm not actually demonstrating this very well, but in general, I'd, I, I'd like to, to listen more because- You're fine, doing fine, by the way. Well, who, who gets the microphone? I mean, who's, whose stories get told? Um, my story got told. Caitlyn Jenner's story got told. Um, you know, but in, before that, you know, um, Renee Richards' story got told. Um, so the narrative was, was dominated for a long time by by these white ladies, you know, you know, and, and now that's changing. Um, now we have Laverne and we have Janet Locke and we have, um, non-binary people and we have trans men and we have, um, we have all these other ways of being trans and, and kind of being a woman, um, in the world. So, um, you know, maybe it's good that I'm at the point in my career where I'm, I'm kind of stepping back because I feel like my story's been told and what we need now is, um, is other stories. Um, and how do I empower other stories? I listen and when I can, I, um, I try to, to bring attention to, um, to the stories that other people are telling. Um, I guess I, that, that seems to me like good work and the work that needs to be done now. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer. And also thank you for um, your vulnerability. You know, I, for me as a black trans woman, I, I, I was probably that last wave of like <laughs> folks coming into trans identity and especially a black trans woman um, who kind of saw that I think the tail end of that era where you really only saw the stories of white trans folks like this was you know about 10 years ago and Jenner didn't you give Caitlyn Jenner a hard time at some point am I remembering that yes but that was actually after my you know my experience in college so when I was in college say about a decade ago I mean the books that I had to look to were really it was she's not there it was Carolyn Caroline Cozy's memoir. It was oh. even Julia Serrano had just kind of come right. into the sphere. So it really wasn't until just as I was leaving college that I saw someone like Janet Mock and her memoir wasn't out. So there weren't really stories. And I think for me, having been a black trans woman that went to college, there was saving grace and having your story there, having those other stories there. Um, but the concept of a black trans woman's story being immortalized in a book, even I wasn't there. And so I was kind of locked out with my own privileges and, and having access to upper, you know, to higher education. So 
So it's so interesting, I think, to hear all of that. I think we're all reckoning with the privileges that we may have and also, of course, the, the oppression <laughs> that we experience. And so I appreciate the vulnerability around this conversation. Um, I, and I also think that that's kind of the perfect segue into our first audience question. Um, so someone said they teach eighth grade to mostly Asian and Latinx and white students. Um, but they feel like they have a limited view on some of these ideas that I, I think the latest generation um, are grappling with. Um, they feel that, um, and I'm assuming this is Gen Z, even though everyone likes to say millennials, you know, are still being born today. Um, <laughs> but they're saying, you know, for Gen Z, um, it seems like they're less encumbered by issues of gender and sex. Mm -hmm. And I would add, you know, we could also see what the conversation is around race, right? Any of these kind of identifiers. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Do you actually feel like this latest generation is less encumbered by these issues? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, let, yeah. I mean, you know, you don't want to do a blanket, you know, I'm a sociologist by training. And so when you say generation, I have to sit up straight and make sure I don't say yes. Generational thought says, because I'll get kicked off the island or whatever. Uh, you know, I have a lot of young people in my life and um, <laughs> got to tell you, it certainly feels that way, um, you know, in a small corner of the world. Um, again, for the horrific crap show that uh, the internet may be, connectivity uh, does a lot for discourse and for networking people and ideas. It is one of the most powerful social transformations we have seen quite literally, I think since probably the railroad, right? The internet really did do that. There is something that I think young people um, are doing and sharing with each other. I, um, I mean, we just know even just empirically, uh, demographically, that there are more young people identifying um, as non-binary, for example. Um, and I, I think that is, you know, indicative of two things, them knowing earlier in their lives that that's a language, that that's a thing you can become. I mean, so much of this is about quite, you know, literal representation. Like it is easy for us to poo poo it. And even I do it on occasion, you know, representation is not politics. Yeah, it's very true. Um, but representation does on more than uh, the rare occasion save someone's life, right? representation does do some work. And I think this is a, you know, a powerful example of that, which is, you know, there were always non-binary children. They just didn't have a language for it, right? And so, yeah, this wonderful thing opens up where, you know, a, a person um, has the tools to explain their lives and their experiences because it's been represented somewhere. Um, and then again, you know, this may be the, for all of the fake danger we create around our young people and children, um, I think as far as identity goes, this is a generation, the safest we've produced uh, of a generation that feels safe enough to explore um, sex and gender at younger ages. And, you know, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, uh, because knowing it, ha having it represented and knowing that's what you are is quite different than being in an environment where you are safe enough to express it, right? So you kind of have to have both. So for all the things we've done horribly wrong, <laughs> and we've done a lot wrong <laughs> to these poor children, um, one of the things we seem to have kind of gotten right is that better than the generation before them, certainly better than my generation, there are more young people who have both the language and the safety to be who they are and, and to express that to each other. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can I say something? When, um, Raquel, when you read She's Not There, um, which was written like 20 years ago now. Yeah. It, 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 I'm very proud of that book, but um, in that book, I, I think, reading it now, there's, which is a story of a, if you haven't, if you don't know the book, it's a memoir of coming out as trans. Um, there's this faint and sometimes not so faint aroma of apology. There's a way in which the book and that narrative, the story that the story that I was telling is a story of, in some ways, 
I'm so sorry that I'm different. I hope you can find in your heart um, the, the love to understand and forgive me. Um, and I mean, that was, that was my experience very much of, of coming out in, at the end of the 20th century. Um, that's what our children and you know, Gen Z, I think it, by a large measure does not have now. They're not apologizing for who they are. Um, there's, you know, uh, they're saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm trans, get over it. Or not, not even get over it, but, but isn't this a great thing? How cool is it that I'm trans or non-binary? You know, I never thought that being trans or that being, I never thought that being trans was cool until years after I was finally through transition. I thought, oh, wow, I did the thing. I managed to survive it. How amazing was that? That's cool. Um, now, I don't know if this um, is true for race. Um, and so it, it's, it's not for me to say, but I, I, would, I hope that, um, what's the language around difference? What's our language around how we account for the difference between ourselves and normative culture? Is it apology or is it, um, joy and celebration. What I, on a good day, what I hope is that now people don't measure who they are by their distance from normative white, straight mm -hmm. American culture. That I think, I, I hope we're getting closer to a place where um, you, can, you can be your own goddamn self and, and be proud um, and define yourself by who you are rather than in terms of where you stand in relationship to mainstream culture. But again, like I said, I don't, maybe, maybe that's not for me to say because um, I'm a white lady. Um, so I, I haven't, I, I mean, I've had the experience of gender, but I haven't had it of race. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's, it's such an interesting thing to think about, you know, when I think about, and I'm, I'm just kind of riffing here. But when I think about where we are with um, the conversation around trans um, acceptance or affirmation, um, it almost feels like we're starting to move into what would be, in maybe in some ways, comparable to like a Black Power phase, mm -hmm. you know, decades ago. Assertive identity as opposed to the response about yeah 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 and i think we're just on the precipice of that and what's interesting about race is and again maybe it goes to that double consciousness mm -hmm. especially being several you know at least a generation or two removed from i think that initial black power conversation is we do have that double consciousness of like blackness is dope as hell but also we still know that it's so stigmatized in our society mm -hmm. right and so while we can go home and it's black power this in some ways and all of that and i can love you know my natural hair at home that's not the same as what it means to love my natural hair or my blackness yeah. in a workspace or in public or on an interview for msnbc you know <laughs> Exactly. And if you do the analog to my mind, I actually have, I do think about it in those movements, like you were just saying, Raquel, seriously. I think about, if you think about um, uh, the intersection of race um, and gender identity, um, having this moment, I actually don't know that you get to that level of affirmative gender identity expression, except going through race for that very reason. Like, I actually think, I don't think you get to have that trajectory of full out forward acceptance because I think that there are, um, you can't solve one double consciousness and leave the other behind. I think both of those kind of have to happen for the affirmative identity process to work itself out. And so I think, I don't think it's an accident, by the way, that, you know, who tends to be leading in popular culture anyway and in the discourse on that affirmative identity action are young people of color. That is, young black latinx people by and large who i think are doing some of that you know the, the large share of that work of <laughs> you know really you know moving beyond apologizing and into forward leaning um uh 
identity um, work. And I, I think there's a reason for that is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think it's because it is analogous to those movements, yeah. Right, do we go to white, straight, cis people? Is the argument for our humanity, the argument of, I mean, you saw, I, I mean when, I was the, when I was the chair of GLAAD uh, uh, 10 years ago, that the, the, the argument for equal rights for gay men and lesbians was very much, there was this tension between on the one hand, we're just like you, straight America. We're the cop on the corner and the fireman next door. And, you know, other, other than, than who, who we love, we're, we're, we're your friends and we're your neighbors. And, and, you know, that's, and that's not a bad argument. But there's another argument, too, which is, um, actually, we're not just like you. Uh, we're all really super different, and in fact, that's the good thing. And mm -hmm. if you want to build a more fair America, you make room in your life for my difference. It's not about me having to suck up to you and say, look, look how, how, how much like you I am. We change the world by everyone opening their heart and making room for each other. And there's no like one default human. Um, yeah. But you know, but, but again, that's that's so yeah, far not away. just like you, not the cop on the corner, but but we're not right. like you, and, and and we can't stand the cop on the corner. That to me is right. like that's next level and where I think we're yeah. headed. <laughs> no, I I, not the cop on the corner, <laughs> but after the cop on the corner. <laughs> I oh my god that took me out no I, I think that's 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 spot on um and and we actually so I know we're we're hitting um 8 32 we're gonna ask maybe one more question one or two from the audience we'll see how this goes and then do a quick closing because people are still very much into our conversation y'all um I you know before we go on to the next question I just What's so interesting about that argument um, around we're just like you, and, and I think both of you spoke so perfectly to this, is that especially in looking at the LGBTQ plus community, you know, it wasn't the folks who were arguing we're just like you, you know, who made the big stink at Stonewall, right? It really right. was right. the folks who led that tip over point saying we're not just like you and we're also not going to abide by these rules that you set forth because of that right we're actually something more and we deserve something more um and in some ways the movement was co-opted from that mo from that moment and now 50 51 years later we've kind of almost come not full circle but spiraled around to that same spot again so that now we can i think we can celebrate um difference without having to pretend that we're something that we're not or pretend that our value is in how much we resemble mm -hmm. everybody else right absolutely so i want to jump to this question now this might feel a little left field <laughs> um so this question uh says speaking of body power Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's new song, WAP. I don't know if we can say what it fully means on um, a Miss Foundation Brooklyn Historical Society. Exciting. Uh, so great. Okay. Conversation. But WAP, you can look it up. It may be the most explicit song ever to reach the top of the Billboard chart. How does this accomplishment speak to women, power, and bodies? Oh. I know, it's a lot to unpack. <laughs> Dude, first of all, I must be old because, is it right? Well, I guess they're saying on top of the pop charge, which is its own kind of complicated thing because then you're saying the pop audience is the important one and we usually think that because the pop audience is more white because mm -hmm. I clearly remember two live crew. I I thought going to the number one, but that might have been Urban Charts, but okay. Um, and I might push back on it being like the most explicit for that reason. It is probably, yes, the most explicit that, a, oh, now I want to think about it. Depends on how you understand pop artists like Madonna, though. 
Right. Uh, like, let's be honest, you know, yeah, actually, I'm, I, I might even say that there might be a different, there might be a different argument for that. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to say that it was the first, not sure I'm going to say it's the only, I will say it might be the only one I can remember where it's non-white women and no man on the track also. <laughs> right like so usually what would used to have to happen is a woman has to of course there's you know the Svengali thing in, in uh, pop music and in pop culture a woman needs to be presented by a man if she's going to do a sexual performance um and hip-hop has been just as guilty of that as rock and roll as uh as pop music has been so the you know the the iteration before Cardi B and Meg would have you would have had to have been presented by you know Notorious B.I.G. at one point or by Jay Z at one point. The, the fact that there is no man on that track, they've just completely excised the male gaze, both from the visual of that song in the video and from the song itself, um, which is very exciting. That's a whole lot of fun. Uh, I, if I don't know, I'm still not quite sold. There's a you know a wonderful. Um, Oh gosh, a uh, young black uh, woman writer, uh, and I'm going to remember her name here in just a second. It's just because I'm trying to remember it. Um, she was recently on our show on Here to Slay to talk about this very thing. Um, and she was selling us on the idea that, yes, this is a particular moment in black women and women's empowerment um, of owning the body. I think there's also a more, another argument to be made, one that is not grounded in sexism, by the way, or racism or patriarchy. Um, that argument that this is unbecoming for women, that this is explicit in a, in a deviant way. That's an argument that can be had, not interested in that one. I do think there's an argument to be made about how much they grounded in the body in a certain kind of way. Um, like, does a woman who is no longer in her sexual prime still have that power? Are we still attaching it to ideas of beauty um, and embodied beauty? Like, I think that might be a, a, that's a sophisticated, I think, critique or argument maybe to have. Um, but honestly, I'm usually too busy to have that argument because I do think the song is a bop and I <laughs> do enjoy greatly that there are no men. And listen, I love a song with a nice, strong line that, uh, uh, you know, tells a man where he should sit and for how long. And this song has many of those. And so by the time that happens, I do forget sometimes to have on my critical lens. Um, I will say there's something about the pop culture moment that, that women, they are probably the first hip hop art, female hip hop artists that I can recall that are owning their own image in that way. And to have been so successful, not just on the quote unquote urban or black music charts, but in the pop charts, which I think speaks to how much kind of going back to young people in that sex and gender question, young people, so, you know, more broadly, I think have a far more sophisticated palette for these things than any previous generation. And I think we're seeing that in their ability to cross over and have that kind of economic success and to own it. Now, the question of whether or not that economic success translates into power is always a question. How powerful can we be at somebody else's expense and all of that? Um, but I would just encourage people right now to just lean into the song and enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because, it, you know, it did spark outrage from many a white, you know, cis straight conservative figure, male oh, figure in particular. So there was like Ben Shapiro. Um, I think there were actually like also just like actual politicians. Who, which was bizarre. Which was bizarre. So I don't know what that means, right? What does it mean for the pandemic so long? I just, I think maybe we've all been socially isolated too long. There was no universe where I should have ever heard Ben Shapiro's uh, opinions on a hip hop song, ever. <laughs> it never should have happened. And so I'm just gonna chalk that one up to the pandemic and hope that when we reemerge into society that this moment will have passed. Yeah. Yeah, there was something so interesting about that. I had made the quip, um, you know, that it's more acceptable for someone to brag about grabbing someone else's that is keyword than um, for someone to brag on the amazingness of their own. Yep. Um, and so I, that's, it's so interesting to me. And I think that it also just, it ties into a lot of these conversations around um, agency 
a celebration of the body, you know, particularly for women of color, disabled women, of course, trans women. Um, Jennifer, and, and um, we can close out here, but is, is there anything, I guess, that you would like to add about where we are in terms of just talking about the body in, in um, empowered ways as women? Well, I mean, we, we've touched on so much of this already. I, I feel like what we're learning is that the language is still evolving um, as we become smarter and more open-hearted. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, we're, you know, what we've suffered through these last four years is about as terrible as it's gonna get. But, you know, um, this country has never failed to surprise me in both in, in what it can do and also in how low it can sink. Um, these, these last four years have been pretty un unspeakably awful for, for, ev for everybody. The people on the margins, the, I mean, I think especially. So... Are we, are we about, to, are things about to get better? Um, I hope they are. It feels like they are. Um, some of, some of the, the signs of hope we've seen as part of the conversation from the last, this last hour are, are things that are important to me and are, and are things that give me a reason for hope. But the last four years, assuming it's limited to four years, will never not have happened. Mm -hmm. and you know, if, even if, if we, if we, if we, if something new begins in January, great. But whoever we are, we were also this. Um, and I think, um, I think we, I think, you know, we, I think we have to, uh, to kind of, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of things that were hidden. Um, maybe they were more hidden from white, from, from white liberal people like me. Um, maybe, you know, maybe for black people, um, these last four years was no surprise. But it was a surprise to me. And I, I already had a pretty low expectation of, of what we could be. So how do we, I mean, I'm hoping that the future is going to be brighter. But um, we, we're going to have to learn from this time we've been through. and. Um, and, and the lessons are hard. Um, okay. it, 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 these have been bad, it's been, it's been a bad time. And um, there's no guarantee that something worse isn't just around the corner. And, I mean, I know I'm supposed to end on a, on a happy note, <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll end, I'll end where, where I began. I, 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 it was just funny. Um, historian Barbara Fields is in my head today. I don't know why. Um, but, you know, so 19th Amendment, 100 years ago today. Um, how great is that? How far have we come? But, uh, you know, this, this war that we're in, of which the 19th Amendment was a major part, it can still be lost. It can still be taken away from us. And um, so, the, and, and the only way, the only way out is forward by continuing the fight. Wow. Well, thank you both. I mean, that was so sobering. And, you know, I, I'm, I hope I can speak for a few folks, if not everyone in our audience. Um, if, we have thinkers and feminists and um, and scholars such as both of you and writers such as both of you <laughs> and also our puppet friend. Um, it looks like our future is only going to be brighter. So thank you both for what you contribute on a daily basis. Um, and that wraps up our first conversation in this series. Really quickly, Tracy, could you tell folks, because someone did ask who was on your pen? I'm so glad they asked. That's why I wore yes. it. I someone would ask. This is my Zora Neale Hurston pen. It's Zora. Perfect. It was uh, one of uh, my patrons. Yes. Thank you for asking. Of course. Well, thank you all for joining 
us. Thank you to our lovely panelists. Um, just to raise up one more time, if you're interested in buying copies of either Tressie's new, well, latest release, uh, thick. It's been out for a little minute, but it, you know, all of this. Yes, all right. Exactly. <laughs> if you're interested in buying copies of Thick or Good Boy, which is Jennifer's latest release from this year, um, we've partnered with Community Bookstore on 7th Avenue in Brooklyn, keeping it local. So please look in the chat um, and find it. And of course, you can find them on the interwebs. And also, Stay tuned because our next conversation will be in about two weeks. We will be talking about economic power on Wednesday, September 9th at 7.30 p.m. Um, and we will have a powerful conversation with Sally Krawcheck, founder and CEO of Elvest, and Miss Foundation's own president and CEO, Teresa C. Younger, uh, and it will be moderated by Sadali Malaku, author of You Don't Look Like a Lawyer, Black Women and Systemic Gendered Racism. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned throughout this fall. We will have more conversations coming to you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. And thank you, Trusty and Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Raquel. It was an okay. honor to be with you both. Thank you. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone.